relatively painless, wasn't it? A little bit. All right, you young people that are back in that back row, if you do the wrong thing, you always go to the people that you've wronged and ask their forgiveness, okay? You don't try to hide it. You don't try to cover it up. What you just saw is what churches are supposed to do. And so uh, remember that. Next time you do something you're not supposed to do, make it right. All right, in, uh, we're in Romans chapter 12 tonight. The hands down greatest Okay, and her name? Regan, Reagan, Reagan. Let's pray for Reagan. Lord, I'm asking on behalf of this baby <clears throat> who basically can do nothing for herself. She is absolutely defenseless. I'm praying that you would be her physician, be her advocate, be her strength, be her health. Do what doctors cannot do. Bless their ministry to her, but I pray that you would do what no medical facility or team can do, and that's restore this child to health. Thank you for doing this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, John. The greatest doctrinal treatise in the world is the book of Romans, and we've talked about this on a number of occasions, how Romans <clears throat> is uh, it's an x-ray of salvation and what righteousness is, and righteousness is not your behavior, Righteousness is your position. And to be made righteous means that we are, we are at perfect conformity to a perfect standard. And of course, human beings can't do that. God places us in Christ. And when we're placed in Christ by faith, that is your righteousness. We don't work up to it. We don't behave up to it. And now that we're right with God, that creates a new creature. New creatures have new behaviors. They have new uh, attitudes, new everything. There's, on occasion, do we as Christians agree to commit sin that we committed in our old life? Yes, we do that. And I can't say, well, it's because um, it's my wife. She makes me, I can't. Now, would that be convenient? If you could blame it on your spouse. How about those kids? You know how nutsy those kids will make you, right? You know how, you know how Washington will make you. You know how your neighbor. Well, I can't say that uh, about any sin that I commit. What can I say? Why do we commit sin as Christians? Because we want to. Uh, it gives us expression to our emotions, whether it's like anger or lust or whatever it is. It's, we, we do that on occasion. And um, so in chapter 12 now, Paul says, I beseech, we do not use that word today. It means to beg. I beg of you, therefore, brethren, by or by means of the mercies of God that you present your bodies. Now, this is an oxymoron. A what? A living sacrifice. Do you know of any Old Testament sacrifice that lived? All of them died. By the way, so did this one. We, we are, we're dead in Christ, which gives us life. And so now we are to present our living lives as a sacrifice. And there are a couple of traits to this type of sacrifice. Number one it is a holy sacrifice, H-O-L-Y. And holy is set apart. It is uh, righteous. And again, we're not that outside of Christ. And so we are holy. We're acceptable to God. If you're saved, 
you have been given this instruction here to present yourselves a living lamb, a living sacrifice, holy. In the Old Testament, if the lamb or the animal was diseased or injured in any way, it was not holy. That was an unholy sacrifice. It could not be accepted at the, at the altar. Uh, the priests even went so far. They were like surgeons. They were medical people. They would kill the animal and cut open like a, a leg bone. And they would get some of the marrow out of that leg bone. And if it was dry and brittle, that was a diseased animal. They'd throw him in the garbage. If it was moist and pink, it was a healthy animal. And they would proceed with the sacrifice. And so we're talking about uh, not just appearance. We're talking about an internal purity. So it's not enough just to come to church and to look the part. There has to be an internal purity in our lives. And so holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And we're talking about rational. Reasonable is the word rational. And it is in harmony with the highest purpose of life. What, what is the highest purpose of a believer's life? To reveal the glory of God. All right, to reveal the glory of God. That is a rational purpose for the believer. That is the reasonable thing. If you make a, uh, let's say if you, you build a hammer, what's the reasonable purpose for that hammer? You want to drive nails or pull nails out or tear something up. That's pretty much all you can do with a hammer. You can't take pictures with a hammer. You can't cook with a hammer. It's got a pretty limited scope of, of use. So as Christians, we have a limited scope. The world does not have access to us. The world should not have access to us. It does, it, it does not have access to our minds or our emotions. That is the Lord's instrument. We belong to the Lord. So, Paul is begging us as Christians to present yourself a living sacrifice. To surrender control of yourselves. Which is holy and acceptable. This is the rational thing to do. Verse number two. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we've got two verbs here. One is conformed, and the word conform means um, to press to the external shape of. It's uh, like take a piece of clay and you make it into the shape of, uh, I don't know, a coin. Well, it's not a coin, but it looks like a coin. And then there's the word transform. And the word transform means from the inside out. You, you become something from the inside out, not the outside in. And so isn't it easy to be a conformed Christian? We look like a coin. We look like a Christian. But there's no internal evidence of that. And so Paul says that we are to be renewed by this transformation of the mind. And this, this transformation of the mind, uh, it is to receive a new mindset. We've got, I don't know how many illustrations of that in here tonight. Did you receive a new mindset when you gave your heart to the Lord? Did you think differently? You had different, I don't know, appetites and desires. And, you know, I, I used to want to do this and now I want to do this. And so that we don't just do this by ourselves. We don't say, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. We don't need a new leaf. We need a new life and we get that from salvation. And so be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. All right. So we are the living proof that God's will is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, these are not concentric circles. And I've heard this, you know, God has a good will and an acceptable will. That's not what this is. This is the description, the, the overall total description of God's will. It's good, it's perfect, and it's acceptable. And so, if I am conformed to the principles of Christianity, um, am I proof that God's will is good and perfect and acceptable? If I'm just conformed? No. No. You know, I go to church, I do all that stuff. No. What becomes the proof is when I am transformed. And this transformation is not physical discipline. This transformation is an internal thing that happens in my very psyche, my very heart and mind, and it works its way out. That is the proof. It is changed life, not just changed behavior. It is changed direction. It is changed desires. It is just, is the, it's not just changed um, habits. You know, anybody can change their habits for a period of time, and you kind of get tired of doing that, by the way. You know, that'll wear off. 
But verse number three, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Uh, don't overthink yourself. Don't put yourself on your personal pedestal and, and think that I made myself a Christian by my behavior. You know, I, have, I have conformed to all the rules and the reg regulations of my church or uh, my friends or, or the group that I run with. And so don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think soberly. Um, think reasonably. Think truthfully about yourself. Look at who we are. What were we before we got saved? We were, we were that. We get saved now. We didn't get saved because God paid us off in salvation because of our good behavior. That's, that's not what we're, what we're doing here at all. I need to understand I am what I am by the grace of God, according to Scripture. So I am to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure or the gift of faith. And the word faith there is spiritual insight. If I have spiritual insight, I won't think of myself more highly than I ought to think. People that brag, people that boast, people that are arrogant, they don't know who they are. You know, it's, it's like a person that is just covered with oil and grease and dirt and mud, and they're bragging about how good they look, you know, bragging about how good they smell. You really don't know what you look like, you know. Uh, you, you really don't know the impact that you're having on people around you. And so uh, God gives us this um, spiritual insight. And all of us are different. And there are two things that every human being ought to know about themselves. Every Christian, I should say, should know about themselves. Number one, you need to know your temperament type. You need to know that you have a unique, among the human beings of earth, you are different and you are unique. Everybody is. So don't think you're the only unique one in the world. You're not. You are the only you on earth. I'm the only me on earth. And so I need to know my temperament type because with your temperament, you have strengths and weaknesses. And we've talked about this for 30 years here. You have a set of strengths and you have a set of weaknesses. And your weaknesses are your strengths carried to extreme. If you were a choleric, for instance, you're a natural leader. You make quick decisions. But can you carry that to extreme? Yeah. And you can become bossy and dictatorial and tell everybody what to do and nobody wants to be around you. If you're sanguine, you have a natural tendency to look at life from a, a humorous point of view. So how, can you take that to extreme? Yes, you joke about everything. Every, nothing's ever serious. And that, that's as annoying as being told every move to make in life. And then you've got your melancholy. And of course, they overthink everything. And they don't, they don't make fast decisions because they've got to have it perfect. And, and uh, you know, they can get a little irritated with the people that don't think like they do and have the standards they have. And so it's, you know, that can be taken to extremes. And then you've got your, um, the, the phlegmatic that is just, they're under the radar. They don't make decisions at all. They're, they're, they appear to be lazy. Uh, they're, they're low key. They fit in any kind of a situation. Can you carry that to extreme? Yes, uh, to the point where they just they don't want to get anything done in life. Now, there's another thing you need to know about yourself. You need to know your spiritual gift. You need to know how God has designed you in the Christian life. What role do you play in this church? See, everybody has a ministry. Everybody in here has a ministry. I don't know what yours is. Uh, I, I think I know what mine is. So I, I'm not responsible for yours. I don't assign that to you. This church doesn't assign you your spiritual gift. God does that. And he does that. He gives you the temperament at the point of your conception. He gives you your spiritual gift at the point of your new birth. All right, now, in verse number four, having, or four, as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Now, he's writing to a single church. He's writing to the church at Rome there were many members there were many body parts in this single church at Rome as missionary Baptist as fundamental Bible believing Baptist we do not believe in the universal church 
We don't believe that everybody in the world is a member of this great big invisible body. We don't believe that. I don't think you'll find that in Scripture. As a matter of fact, I know the Bible doesn't teach that, but the language won't let that be true, first of all. Uh, the word ecclesia uh, and the word catholicos, those were two uh, vocabulary words that were available in the first century for Jesus to use. The word catholicos meant universal, and it's where we get the word catholic from. The word uh, ecclesia meant a local visible body of and it was a political word it wasn't even a spiritual word it was like the city council do we have an actual city council that actually meets county commissioners county commissioners that actually meet in a building all of them can get in the same place we don't have an in, invisible universal county commission and so th that's the word jesus chose of, of those two vocabulary words he chose the one that meant local visible that's why we believe in local visible body. We believe in closed communion. We believe that the only people that should participate in the Lord's Supper is, you know, members of our church here. So now, verse number four says that, now we have, look at we've got a lot of different members here. And everybody doesn't have the same office. And here's the analogy. We've got body parts. Um... You have very few body parts that duplicate each other. We have two eyes, and, and these two eyes do the same thing. Um, we have, most of our body parts have different functions. Your liver does something different than your spleen, and your spleen does something different than your epiglottis. And so we have all of these parts. But what, what is the one thing that these body parts have in common? What do they do? Support the health of the body. Uh, that's the purpose of them. And I, I don't know what your appendix, for instance. I'm not sure what the appendix does. Nancy could probably tell us in a few words. It's got to be necessary or we wouldn't have one. And so verse number uh, five says, So we, being many, are one body, and every one members one of another. I'm a member of you. This is, this is a body. We're not just members of the same tax-exempt organization in the state of Florida. We are a body. We are members of one another. We're each other's eyes and ears and, and nose and spleen. And, and I don't know what body part, you know, necessarily we, we serve. But I, I know that we are, we are that. We are a single body. We have different members. Verse number six, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us. And so now he's going to specify, and he's going to give us a list of seven spiritual graces or gifts. You have one of these gifts. You have, it's just like a temperament. You have a dominant and you have a secondary. Uh, your spiritual gift is something that you have been gifted to do, and you do it better than you do anything else. You might not know what your gift is, but you've been doing it all this time. But you might not, oh, that's the gift of this, that, or the other. So look at verse number six. <clears throat> Having them gifts differently according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy. So gift number one is the gift of prophecy. Uh, it means to reveal or explain truth. Now, there are two kinds of prophecy in the Bible. There's predictive prophecy and declarative prophecy. Predictive prophecy is the kind of stuff that David or Daniel did and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and John in Revelation. These guys were forging through the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They were, they were looking into the future and the Holy Spirit was just revealing on Here's what's going to happen, write it down. And then this is going to happen, write that down. And we don't do that today. I cannot predict the future. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I am a declarative prophet. John is a declarative prophet. Aaron is a declarative prophet. That means that we just reveal what has already been prophesied. Now, I can do that. You know, I can talk about future events based on past revelation here. And so there are some people that are called to preach. They're called to reveal truth. They are called to unravel the mysteries of God. They are called to explain. They're called to expose. I think that's probably my primary calling in life is to do that. And I feel comfortable doing that. You will feel comfortable doing the thing you're gifted to do. There's some folks would not want to come up here and teach this small group here tonight. You, how many of you would just choke up if I asked you to come up here and, and teach for five minutes? Right, Brenda, okay, all right, most of you. This is just not what you're called to do. But 
you would feel as comfortable doing your thing, doing the thing you're gifted to do, as I feel doing this, all right? And so there's, there's gift number one. All right, so if this is your gift, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Proportion, it doesn't mean amount. Uh, it means to stay in your lane. There, there was a commercial back a number of months ago. I think it was, this guy was doing a, he was in a tattoo, a, a tattoo parlor. And this guy started kind of disagreeing with something. And, and this guy looks at him and says, bro, stay in your lane. And I love that. <laughs> stay in your lane. Uh, it, it means, you know, you, I'll take care of what I'm supposed to take care of. And you take care of what you're supposed to take care of. So as a, uh, as a teacher and a revealer of truth, I'm staying in my lane. Uh, I am to do the thing God has gifted me to do. Look at verse number seven. Or ministry. Now the word ministry is, it means service of a deacon. Now, what are deacons? You're aware that deacons have no authority in the Bible at all. There's not one fiber of authority given to a deacon. So, so then what's the purpose of a deacon? It's to serve. It's to serve. It, to do the physical things. To do the manual things. Uh, now, in, in our culture today, uh, we don't probably need people to go feed the oxen. But that's what a deacon, you know, to go feed the ox, take care of people when they couldn't take care of themselves. But today, you know, we've got folks that might need to be taken to the doctor. Maybe they need their yard mode or whatever. Uh, you know, things that need to be done around the body and within the body. So they are to do that. And there are some folks that love to do that. You notice when we have lunch here at church, after, after lunch, there will always be a group of people. They'll get up and they'll start cleaning the kitchen. They'll start washing dishes and putting them up. You got other folks be sitting at the tables talking. And there are, there are people, and they don't want to be pointed out, by the way. Not the ones that are sitting and talking, but the ones that are working. They don't, they don't want to be, they don't do it for the spotlight. They just love to serve. How many of you just love to serve? You just show me what you want me to do, preacher. And they don't want to be mentioned. They, just, they don't want that. They just, they just feel fulfilled when they do something for somebody else. And so some of you do that. All right, look at verse number seven. Or, they are rather, let us wait on our ministering. So if you have this gift, and the word wait doesn't mean, okay, I'm going to wait. The word wait means to be occupied with. It means to be busy with. So if you have this gift of serving, be busy about doing that. Our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching. Uh, teaching is taking people from the known to the unknown. And this is a person, normally people that have the gift of teaching are good at that. And when they're through, you understand something that you didn't understand before. In other words, you've been taken from the known to the unknown. And I, I've been under and, and heard people teach that had the wonderful gift of teaching. And they could take the simplest little statement and just go. And when they were through, I was like, oh, my word, never in a million years would I have seen that. I, man, thank you for that. And, and so there, and there are other people that when they teach, it's just like they just talk in circles. Um, and when you're through, it's like, What? You know, it's just, you don't understand. I've, I've heard preachers preach that when they were through, I was like, I think I was more confused than when they began. And, and uh, so I don't ever, ever, ever want to do that. But there are those that have this gift. All right, now, if, if that is your gift, then you wait on teaching. You, know, you be occupied with teaching. You use every opportunity that you have to teach your your kids or your church or whatever area that you have. Verse number eight, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. And, and again, the word wait is understood. Be, be occupied, be busy with this is understood in the beginning of any of, and all of these is so wait, be occupied with exhortation. What does it mean to exhort? It means to urge to practical duties. You just, you just urge people, you encourage people to do the things that they need to do. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Well, the word simplicity there means generosity. And you would never get that from the word simplicity. You think it would be simple, but um, it's, it, if you're going to do that, give with generosity. Now, this is not tithing, by the way. Every Christian 
is under the New Testament command to tithe. And so tithing is not a gift. That's an instruction. Well, what is this? This is the individual that has the gift of giving. They love to give like the teacher loves to teach. They love to give like the servant loves to serve. They love to give uh, like those that have the gift of mercy love to show mercy. And so these are people that normally I've noticed through the course of my, my life in ministry, people that have the gift of giving normally are very well off. This is why. Because the Lord knows he can trust that individual to share now, if you make a dollar, I don't think he expects you to give a dollar away every time you make a dollar. I mean, you've got to live yourself. But the Lord will see to it that in the, in the pipeline of blessing to yourself, that you yourself will be blessed, but you will have left to give. And so this is that person. Now, uh, do that with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. And the word, the word ruleth means to stand in front of. We're talking about um, guidance talking about leadership that's your job then do it with diligence and the word diligence actually means with haste um, it, it seems as though everything in the Bible there's a there's a kind of a speed limit behind it uh, we as preachers we are to study to show ourselves approved and study doesn't mean go to school although I think that's part of what we're supposed to do the word study there means to hurry up so you hurry up and show yourself. You know, don't wait 40 years after you're called into the ministry. Get busy doing the thing God's called you to do. And so he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Well, I love people with the gift of mercy. Um, the people that have the gift of mercy, if you blunder, they're not the ones that stand over you and say, ha, I knew it. I knew it. You blow it. We just give you enough time. That's not, that person doesn't have the gift of mercy. This is the person that even when you shoot yourself in the foot, they'll help you bind the wound. Uh, they don't bring charges against you. They don't point you out. They don't try to humiliate and call you an idiot. For, you know, they don't do that. Um, and so there are folks that have this gift. They, just, they, don't, they come into a situation non-judgmental. They come for the purpose of bringing the bandages, you know, driving the ambulance, picking you up, making sure that you're taken care of. And so these are the seven spiritual gifts, I think, that are still functioning in the New Testament church today. Now, does anybody know what your gift is? Lorraine? Teaching? Anybody else? Mercy? Okay. Anybody else think you might know? Do what? Service? Okay, yep, okay, service. Uh, you're probably doing it, but you just haven't been able to define it, you know. Uh, I'm not so sure it's as important to define it as it is to do it. Keep doing it, you know. Um, now, look at verse number nine. This is in relation to the church. Uh, in relation to myself, I am to give myself a living sacrifice. In relation to the church, I am to exercise my gift primarily and first of all to my church. Now, what about society? What about those guys out there that are like buzzards circling the place and wolves, you know, hiding in the woods? What, what, how do we do? Well, let love, wouldn't you know it? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, just one time of smack in the head. No, he said, let love be without dissimulation. Nobody used that word yesterday, and it means hypocrisy. So don't fake your love. Don't act like you love somebody. Don't, don't do that. And here's the first thing that Paul says <clears throat> that will reveal the genuineness of your love. You abhor that which is evil. See, if I'm faking my love, that means I'm on the side of doing what is evil. If I genuinely love somebody, I hate the evil that's hurting them. I, I abhor the evil that is destroying their lives. To that, cleave to that which is good. Uh, the word cleave, when we use the word cleave or to 
you know, like a cleaver, I mean, we cut something in half. We separate it. Well, the word cleave here means to stick to, to be glued to. So I am to be glued to that which is good. And, and this glue is to be a lifetime adhesive that, that you, we are consistently glued, not just on Sunday morning. And then, you know, I, I cut the tape and I survive through the weekend and I come back and act like I'm all glued to the truth on Sunday morning. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in or with honor preferring one another to prefer somebody to let them go first to to yield we got yield signs all over the county what does, what does a yield sign tell you to do yield give them the right away yeah and of course I know there are legal definitions of yield and you know uh, what, what road you're on and you know if, if you're a secondary road or a primary road and I'm, I'm aware of all of that but uh, is it a good idea to yield you can get killed by running a yield sign you know but to yield um, I don't need to be first I don't need to be the one up front I don't need the one to always tell you my story I, I don't need to do that you know yield to people and if you do that you will find that you will be a friend that's called on a lot. But if you're first to start telling your story, and that's all that, you know, when you get together with somebody, you just start telling your story. And that's all you ever do. You're going to find that people are going to go, they'll go around you because they've heard your story before. And so I, I, what you do, yield to their story. And how do you do that, by the way? What is the best thing you can do to get people to tell their story? Ask questions exactly right ask questions about them um, over the school we teach um, uh, there's a little acronym that I use F O R M when you're when you're talking with somebody especially if you're in their home on the, you know you're visiting with them and when you go into their home you don't immediately say um, all right if you died right now you know you go to heaven so you've not earned the right to do that yet family um, how long have you guys been married <clears throat> been married 23 years wow where'd y'all meet uh, we met here well you know talk about their, their how about the kids I see you got pictures of kids up how many kids do you? we got three kids really how old are they and so you, you ask about their family and then you just silently transition to uh, well occupation F-O uh, where do you work I work out at Mosaic how long have you been there uh, 13 years what do you do out at Mosaic well I'm, I'm a this or that or whatever they do um, just you, do you like your job yeah well it's okay and you know you're yeah I like it or they'll tell you a little bit about their job ask the wife don't ever ask a woman if she works you ask a lady if she works outside the home because she does work and uh, so find out about their occupation and then transition silently uh, you guys go to church anywhere that's a pretty innocuous question, right? I'm not asking him if he, di if he died right now, would he go to heaven? I'm asking him, would you go to church anywhere? You know, if they're new in the neighborhood. Uh, no, we're, we're kind of new. We haven't found a place yet. Oh, okay. Well, where did you go when you came from Indianapolis? Well, we used to go to da 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 da, da such a church. Uh, that's good. We're, you know, they're pretty regular, pretty involved. Yeah, well, I taught a Sunday school class. Bing. <laughs> All right. Um, and then you transition into the message. Well, can I ask you a question? See, they've allowed you to get that far. They've invited you to the next level. And you go as far as they'll let you go. If you get to this religion, ask, well, do you, you guys, do you attend church anywhere? Preacher, I, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, we, you know, we just left a bad situation, and, and so I just, I just don't talk about it. What do you do at that point? You don't talk about it. You, that's right. You honor that request. And if you do, you leave the door open either for yourself to come back or for someone else, but you, you leave it there. And so we are to be kindly affectioned. We are to yield to people. Now, that doesn't mean that you agree with their sin. That's not what we're talking about here. All right, with brotherly love, honor, uh, preferring one another. Not slothful in business. The word slothful means destitute of promptness. Uh, 
you know, do what you say you're going to do, take care of business, so not slothful in business. Do we in here do business with lost people? We do business with lost people. You know, you, I mean, you've got lost plumbers, lost mechanics, lost air conditioned people. You got lost everything, every, everybody. You know, in every, every avenue of life, we got lost folks. And so, take care of business. If, and this this is included in this, if you're given too much change by a cashier at a store, what's the proper thing to do? Hey, look. You gave me $5 too much. Oh, thank you. So, you know, you think that happens 20 times a day to these cashiers? Oh, if she's given $5 too much change 20 times a day, she needs to be doing something else anyway. But I doubt, I doubt that happens very often. And so that's a, there's a door opener right there. And so not slothful in business, in spirit, fervent in spirit. And the word fervent means to bubble or boil over. Don't you like to be around excited people? People that are motivated and people that are, they just, they just have this excitement about them. Yeah, I love being around people like that. Instead of always around somebody, they find something to gripe about everything. You know, this is wrong and that's wrong and this is terrible and that's terrible. And they never find anything to, to praise or to be encouraged about. And so we are in this verse told to be fervent, to be bubbly in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope or in the state of hope, patient in tribulation, <laughs> patient in tribulation. Um, stay calm. This, this word patient means to remain under. Um, I'm a gun smoke fan. Every now and then, Matt will be fighting this guy out in the out in the, the desert somewhere or the wilderness and th there's a nearby pond or creek you know where they're headed right <laughs> they're going to roll to the creek and, and or the pond they're going to fall in and uh, you know they, they'd be fighting and Matt would push the guy's head you know, when would Matt let him up when he quit fighting exactly because the fight is gone and need to pull him up so when the Lord does that to us he, you know puts your head under the circumstances when will he let you up we start negotiating and complaining and bargaining. Lord, I'll start going to church. You know, well, we're not dead yet. And, and so when he, when he knows that, that the resistance is over, then we're, we're brought to the surface. And uh, so we are to serve the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. And the word instant means steady. Prayer is not just something we do on Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock in here it's not just something you do before your meal um I, i've told y'all before but i got a little book at the house I, I love the name of it what does god do between meals um but we're probably an awful lot of prayer you know is offered up at meal time and, and we should do that but we are to be steady in prayer constant and in, incessant in prayer distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality and the word hospitality means stranger love so there will be times when you'll have an opportunity to do something for somebody you don't know and to be able to help somebody you don't know I don't think you're assigned to everybody I mean how many how many people in this world need help you know can, yeah, can you do something for everybody no you can't do something for everybody but I think there are times when the Lord will just strike your heart with a face or a name or a need you may be driving down the road and you see somebody on the side of the road just sitting on the curb you got a grocery basket with some clothes and some shoes in it and maybe you've driven by that guy 50 times but for some reason today that's, that sticks in your mind. I, ooh, 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 I need to, that man needs something today. That ever happened to you, by the way? Be, be just driving by somebody and there's this pull, you know, and you pull off and, and say, you know, get to meet them and just go to Burger King or McDonald's, get a meal, drop it back to them. And um, 
just let them know. You know, I was, I was thinking about you. Can I pray with you before I did that? And uh, so, verse number 14. Are there some verses in the Bible you wish weren't in the Bible? <laughs> Bless them that persecute you. Somebody persecutes you. How do you bless them? Forgive them? Um, how about saying something like, uh, you know, thank you because what you just did has allowed the grace of God to help me forgive you. And it, it's, this, is a, this is a test. And I want to thank you for being that in my life. God has he's brought me closer to the throne of grace. By your stinking wickedness. No, you wouldn't want to say that. But bless them and persecute you. And don't curse them. Like Aaron was telling us a story in prayer time about this. He was just a young guy. And a 65-year-old man came up to him at work and just went and cussed him out and, and just trying to pick a fight with him. And Aaron just remained, you know, he remained on board, remained calm. And so is, uh, can, can you do that humanly speaking? Humanly, what do you want to do? You, you want to let them hold one. Or you want to cuss them out or, or whatever. But what does grace give you the ability to do? Not do that. Yeah, live in harmony with God and his word. Exactly right. All right, verse number 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. So we enter the emotional state of people. Um, they, they rejoice over an issue. Don't get jealous about their success. Enter that. Somebody is broken. They've got a situation like this little baby. Uh, we, you know, you enter that and you, you, you can join yourself with that individual. All right. Verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things. Now that phrase means don't desire superior positions. I can't wait to get this position so I can tell y'all what to do. I can't wait to get this promotion so I can be the boss over all you little plebeians. That, that kind of an idea. Uh, mind not. Don't, don't push for that but condescend to men of what? Low estate. You get, get on their emotional level. You, you're not, I'm better than you are. I can't waste my time with you. We can't do that. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I think CPM is a good example of that. You know, these folks are they're struggling. They're, they're fighting the battle of their life. How should we respond to that? Well, you got yourself in this hole. Get yourself out. What are, what are you even thinking? Do, and and I'm, I'm thankful that you guys don't do that. And I mention this regularly because it's a regular blessing that you give. It really is. Uh, to let them know they're no less valuable than we are. They're no less important. They're no less loved. They're no less worthy than anybody in this group. He's, he came, we met Mark from CPM. Um, you know, we baptized several of these people. And I mentioned to you before, we baptize these people. They get saved and, and they get baptized. I don't know that they'll ever be back to this church. They may leave that program tomorrow. That young man, Ryan, may leave that program in the morning. I don't know. I may not even see him Tuesday night. But did we do the right thing? We did. We did the right thing. And so, well, we're looking for members that are going to be stable and they're going to be able to come in here and help with a lot of money and da-da-da-da-da. Yes, ma'am. That's exactly what we need to do. It's exactly what we do. All right. Thank you. 
uh, Irene. All right, now, uh, condescend to men of low estate. We are to meet the humble ones. Uh, those that don't have high positions, those that don't have a lot of money. Um, Paul said, I've become what? Yeah. Did he become humble with the humble? Did he, you know, was he, was he able to maneuver and manipulate himself into everybody's life so that he could have an open door? Absolutely he did. All right, verse 17. Recompense, and that means pay back to no man evil for evil he hit me I'll hit him he lied about me I lied about him uh, he hurt me I'm gonna hurt him and that's the that's the world right now I mean it and it always has been actually so don't do that provide things honest in the sight of all men so provide things honest we are to live our life and gather our assets in the right way. Everyone should see, bless both y'all. Uh, everyone should see that the way I prosper in life is not by hurting somebody else or stealing something from somebody else or using somebody else. The world should see um, the, the blessing, the assets that you have, you got that how. Hard work. There are several thousand millionaires in the country. And I read one time that approximately 95% of all millionaires made their money through hard work. Now, there are some that inherited it. But most started with nothing and built themselves up to, to where they are. And uh, so we're told that we're to provide things honest in the sight of all men. Now, <laughs> he throws in a little segue here, if it be possible. <laughs> I appreciate that little bit of wiggle room. <laughs> if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, if it be possible. Really? So is it possible that you can't live at peace with everybody? So if that be the case, what should you do? Fight it out or just withdraw yourself? What's the best thing to do? You just, you just withdraw yourself. Uh, I, will, I will not fight you. I'll leave you alone. And it, uh, if, I, if I detect in someone just this adversarial spirit, argumentative spirit, you won't have to worry about me very long. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't want to fight. I don't, I don't need to defend my position or my truth. I don't even take this. I think even on, on my Facebook page, uh, people get a little adversarial every now and then. And I had a preacher do this recently. I posted something and, and he uh, took a little bit of exception to something. And I mean, this it gave me this great big, this big, long, and he's kind of known for this. He kind of likes to be the, the go-to answer guy. And I responded. I said, thank you for your response. And sent that to him. And I had another preacher call me and just start laughing. And he said, thank you for doing that. He said, this guy loves to argue. I'm not going to do that. I don't have time for that kind of stuff either, you know. It, it face to face or online so don't be hard to get along with you know anywhere so if it be possible verse number 19 dearly beloved avenge avenge not yourself the word avenge means to satisfy an injury now you hurt me and I'm gonna hurt you so dearly beloved avenge not yourself why is that our job who does that, by the way? Who avenges you? God does. And here's the thing. Whatever I do to you is all that's going to be done. What God does to you is going to be a complete job. So, so I've got a choice here. I can either botch it up or 
just get out of the way and let the Lord do a complete job. So which would you rather do? You know? So avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Uh, the word uh, give there it means to vacate the office. Here we are. Uh, vacate the office of the wrath master. That's, that's not our job. It's to pour vehemence on people. God will do that. So I am to vacate the office of wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We read that in our prayer time as well. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. You know nothing like this ever existed before the Bible came along. This is the most radical philosophy of life that the world had ever heard of. And the Romans and the Greeks and the Jews, now, you know, the, they'd come and they would read this and Paul would teach this stuff into these cultures where these Christians were treated like animals. They were killed and brutalized. And, and I'm, I'm to do what? Feed the guy. You know, the enemy that, that attacked you last week? Am I, oh, am I done? Is that? <laughs> okay, we're through, we're through. All right. Uh, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. Oh, now what if somebody is your mortal enemy for whatever unknown reason, and one day he comes to attack you, and you feed him, and can I get you something to drink? What do you think that does to the fire of hatred that he has for you? Pretty much puts it out exactly right. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. I love that. You're going to dump a bucket of fire on his head. Why, he's going to feel like a bum. Now, I came here to do you harm at what? You're offering me a meal? You're going to pay for my lunch? You're, you're going to take, what? I heard you were the biggest idiot in the block, and, and you're doing this. And so this, is, this, this response is what turns people around with regards to Christianity. Now, in many instances, what do we do as Christians? Ah, right, come on, come on. You want some of me? Come on, come on. Well, we're no different in the world. So there, there is no contrast here. So uh, in, in so doing, I heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome. Don't be subdued or vanquished by evil but overcome evil with good. So you show people the, the loneliness of a bitter spirit by conducting yourself in the power of the Holy Spirit. You show them the emptiness of their life by revealing to them the fullness of the Christ life. And this is what creates thirst in people. This is uh, being the salt of the of the world, of the earth that, that creates thirst in people. Now, I am not telling you, and, and you folks are old enough, y'all been around the block, is all of this stuff easy to do? Right. But understanding that he's a prisoner of Satan. He's a prisoner of Satan. He's an agent. Right. His eternal outcomes. I need to pray for him. Right. Yep. So, and again, this is not, oh, I'm going to really try to do this stuff. Uh, well, can I save you some time? <laughs> this is not behavior management. That, that we're doing here. Uh, this is presenting ourselves a living sacrifice. And the Lord infuses into that living sacrifice his traits and his nature. And when we come away from that presentation, this is what we do. And it's, this is, um, grace makes this something you want to do. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And it's not, uh, 
Okay, okay, I'll feed the idiot. Because that's what the Bible says do. Um, that's not the living sacrifice we're talking about here. Uh, when, you're, when you're this living sacrifice and the Lord has infused you with his grace, you want to do it. You find pleasure, you find joy, you find happiness in doing this for this guy. And, you know, you find joy in seeing his face melt. That just, that brings, yes, you know, God's working here. And, you know, you're creating a relationship that otherwise would have only been more adversarial. But, you know, you've handled yourself in such a way that uh, you've, you've turned, like Jamie said, this agent of the evil that is behind this person. You've separated them from that. And so now they have an opportunity to see a Christian in action. Thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate your presence very, very much. And uh, you all have a wonderful week. Lord willing, we will see you. Uh, on Wednesday night and we're well, I don't know what halfway through the book of Ecclesiastes have y'all found a book of Ecclesiastes a little weirdly interesting is that a, a way to put that um, I'm, I'm honestly still trying to get a handle on Solomon's mind uh, and, and this is going to be really this week it's like it's, it's better to die than to live. It's better to get this than that. And, you know, I'm like, what? <laughs> no, that's not right. But we'll look at it from, from a perspective that maybe will make, make some good sense of, of what he's saying. Thank you all for being here. Kids, y'all have a good week, okay? All right. Very, very good. Um, Thomas, who cut your hair, buddy? Or that, that's not Todd Titus. Did you do that? Your mama do that? Did she? Yeah. You told her, did you see that on TV or in a book or something? Okay. We got mohawks when we were kids, by the way. You know what's coming back hairstyle wise? Yeah. <laughs> the mullet, the mullet. No, no, but the mullet is coming back. And I'm like, why 